I decided to do First Corinthians because um, uh, because it ties in so closely to some of the things that we've been talking about. I've actually um, covered first, uh, not all of First Corinthians. Sorry, First Corinthians fifteen, and um, I actually covered a lot of a lot of that. Like um, uh, must have been maybe a year or maybe two years ago. Um, but it ties in so much to the theme of heaven and earth and especially the resurrection. Um, and having gone through this again and, you know, starting um, studying this again, um, it's just all the more vivid. And I think it's like one of these chapters that really uh, once you've um, thought about the things that we've been discussing over the last month or two, uh, where it just makes sense in a deeper way that there's more to see in it you know um so just to kind of like um cover one of the themes that we we were doing is is just the fact that that humanity that humans are heaven slash earth creatures that they're made to rule from heaven but at the same time they're made from dust and to rule the earth um that humans were made for the express purpose of standing at the threshold of heaven and earth to image God and to bring God's rule to bear on the earth as Kings and also to serve as creation's priests before God. So we represent, um, we represent God to the rest of creation or we represent creation to God that we, um, we, we fill those roles. And in spite of our fall from that, because we did fail in that, you know, Adam failed and everybody else has failed since then. But in spite of the falls of man, God has not abandoned them or the earth. He hasn't scrapped the idea of us or the idea of earth. And he's redeeming both through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the redeemer of man. And he's also the redeemer of earth. And we we looked at um, that um, that passage in Revelation where Christ was holding the what he would in one sense is the title deed of the earth because he purchased the earth for himself and he's going to redeem it. Um, so not just redeeming man, but if you redeem man, you have to redeem his purpose as well. And in that process, uh, God redeems. Um, the rest of creation that man was supposed to be in authority over. So the redemption of man and earth involves the defeat and the destruction of the fallen, fallen heavenly powers. When I'm talking about the fallen angels and the raising up of redeemed humanity. As a matter of fact, there's a, um, there are some passages where you see that the fallen angels have, um, uh, you know, uh, that they were, uh, that they've been replaced or be in the process of being replaced. In other words, there's been job openings since their fall. And um, those job openings um, are being filled up by humans. You see this with the 24 elders and well, we won't get into that so much today, but that's uh, a little bit of the, the picture. So first Corinthians 15 verses one and two. It said, I would now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. This word right here, gospel, is evangelion. Um the the plural of that would be um evangelia. And what it was is a specific term that you would use. It was usually a, a, a military victory term that was used in the first century. And what it was is it's, it's the announcement of a um, dignitary or a hero's deeds and victory before they arrive to your city. Um, in other words, you know, so-and-so is on his way. These are the great things they've done, or this is the victory that, that they've just won. These are the battles. These are the list of their accomplishments. They're coming in victory. Get ready because they are coming. 
And what would be expected from that town, that city, whatever, was that they would be, they would form a greeting party, that they would go out of the city and greet that person while they were on their way and provide a triumph, which is this whole uh, kind of like, you know, festal sort of thing where they would um, uh, come out there maybe with like some you know some uh some kind of a you know like a parade a show or uh make a big deal out of it and make a welcome and so that arrival was called a parousia the parousia is another one of those words that is used in the new testament to me to talk about jesus's coming so it's all about um the the way that the gospel writers present this is in these terms. Um, in other words, that Jesus has had this evangelion and that we should be preparing for him to come to earth and that we will meet him. In other words, we'll meet him in the air and um, and we would, um, and his arrival, his parousia uh, would be, um, uh, would be, would be, you know, the marking of our, uh, you know, meeting him in the air. The apostasin is a, a word that Paul uses uh, um, uh, to describe the, um, you know, it's the, us meeting Christ in the air in another passage in Second um, Thessalonians. So all of these are are kind of um, vi they're they're just um, uh, riffing off of the same kind of ideas, you know. So. When we think gospel, you know, uh, we 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 put it into terms that uh, we understand. You know, it means good news, but the evangelion, evangelia, yeah, it means good news. But in their context, this is what that meant. And when uh, pagans or or uh, well, anybody in the in in first century Rome, uh, Roman Empire would hear that, they'd understand what you were talking about that you, you're um you're getting ready that that's the gospel it's um we think uh, jesus paid for your sins and you can go to heaven um it's not the immediate thing that would come to their mind if you told them told them about a gospel okay um so in light of the gospel uh, just as in light of any kind of evangelion um the question would be how do we get ready um, what should we do? So that's why, you know, you have questions like, well, having heard this Evangelion and that this victor triumph, the, the, the one who has overcome the enemy uh, and the enemies of God is on his way and is coming to earth. What must I do to be saved? What, how should I prepare? That was the kind of question that would um, automatically come to, to come to mind. So the task of the believer is to prepare himself, um, this being saved thing up here, you know, uh, to prepare himself and others for Christ's uh, parousia. Uh, we um, are awaiting Christ's return, and he says, you are being saved if you hold fast um, to the word that I preached to you. So I, I don't know what a Calvinist would do with this, um, uh, you know, passage right here. But it a it it's um it it assumes that if you don't hold fast that you know that it, it's it's definitely not selling you a a once saved always saved kind of an idea, um, but it is it's also showing you that um that there is that salvation is a process, you know when Paul talks about the working out your salvation daily in fear and trembling what he's talking about is the preparing um becoming like christ um that whole process of salvation yes you're saved um you're also being saved and in another sense you you are going to be saved so it kind of uh it runs the whole uh gamut it's uh it's probably a little bit different than we're used to thinking about it so in light of this series those who are being saved, and I'm just using Paul's language here, uh, those who are being saved are those who are waiting for Christ to appear and to rule the earth. And we will rule with him 
And actually, we do real, rule with him. I should have rephrased that. His re resurrection is the first fruits um, of our resurrection and the redemption of the earth. His victory over death is the proof that the rebel gods, in other words, the demonic powers, have been de defeated all the way from the sons of God who enslaved the nations um, at, at the at, at, after the Tower of Babel, um, all the way down to sin and death themselves. They're all in the process of being destroyed. They've already been defeated. They will be destroyed. And all authority has been given to Jesus. We're actually living in the time right now that's descri described um, in Psalm 110, where, where God says to, uh, to Jesus, basically, come and sit at my right, right hand and I'll uh, and rule in the midst of your enemies. So it's that time where Christ is on the throne and he's ruling, but it's in the midst of his enemies. Um, so it it's uh, so we we talk always in terms of Christ has won, Christ has uh, defeated death, and he's he he's been given all power and authority. There's still a lot of shenanigans on earth. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that too. So we're living in the time when the son is sitting at the right hand of the father, ruling in the midst of his enemies. We're still at war, but we're post D-Day. In other words, D-Day was uh, basically when uh, you could say, well, the tide had turned and it was already, you know, like uh, there was still things to do. There's still a war to be, to be fought, but in essence, um, you know, the victory was just on the horizon anyway. And the devil knows that his time is short. So when you see a passage in Revelation, you know, woe to you, O earth, because the, the devil's come down to you with the wrath because he knows the time is short. He doesn't have much time left because he knows he's already defeated. The faithful, they're awaiting for Christ's appearing and we're pre preparing to see him in, so to speak. To welcome him. It says in verse 3 through 8. It says for I delivered to you as of first importance. What I also received. When he says received here. He didn't. It's directly from Christ. Um, that he received this gospel. That Christ died for our sins. In accordance with. Or I put it in, in the pattern of the scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with scripture. Um, so it's not in the sense that, you know, in the old Testament that you're going to go back and say, well, Jesus is going to come and suffer on a cross and die. And then he's going to rise again and, and spells it all out. That what happens with Christ is that there is a pattern in scripture uh, and there are patterns in scripture. They're all through the old Testament. Um, that Christ fulfills those patterns. I'll give you a couple of examples. What Paul's talking about in specific right here is that this is in accordance with the creation account. So if you're uh, if you look at uh, the creation account in Genesis, Jesus completes his work just like God completed his work after the seven days. Then he rested on the Sabbath. So he's in the grave um, on the Sabbath. Then the resurrection, which would be uh, a new week, right? The eighth day marks the beginning of a new life and creation. Um, so from Jesus's Passover, um, Easter is the is you know the Passover. He even celebrates the Passover and uh, um, a pre Passover meal with his um, disciples. And he um, and he equates the the Passover meal to himself, and um, so he becomes the Passover lamb. Easter is the delivery from slavery, or the promise of the delivery from slavery that um, that the that Israel was uh, looking at um, on the eve right before they're going to be um, you know set free from Egypt. Then Pentecost would follow 50 days later, right? 50 days after Jesus uh, ascends, you have Pentecost. And that is like the delivering of the law on Mount Sinai, which happened 50 days after uh, Passover. Um, but now we're, we've got a new covenant, not at Mount Sinai, but at Mount Zion. Uh, which we've described before. So it, it's all these patterns and, and Jesus is just following the pattern of the Old Testament um, 
and you see the new the new thing being done or the old pattern being fulfilled. Um, so he's talking about Jesus appeared to Cephas, who's Peter, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive and some have fallen asleep. That means they've passed away. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So now, finally, if you look at James, right, James is, uh, is now a believer because James did not believe that his, um, that his half brother was, uh, was the, the Christ. He thought Jesus was crazy. He wasn't convinced back then. But um, Jesus did appear to James, and of course, <laughs> well, that must have convinced James, right? And he became uh, basically the uh, the pastor in Jerusalem. Um, and then he um, first, of course, he appeared to Peter, um, and he appeared to the other apostles. Um, and last of all, as one untimely untimely born, right here, this the word that's used in. Um, in Greek for untimely born is the same word that you would use for an abortion. Actually, he's, he's not calling himself an abortion per se or anything, but what seems to, there was a, there was a lot of slams on Paul because Paul of course was kind of a bad guy. He's kind of a late comer, you know, like there were questions about whether he, you know, like people were challenging him as being an apostle because um, they were like, well, you couldn't really be an apostle unless uh, Christ had appeared to you, um, especially the risen Christ afterwards. So uh, an uh, apostle, uh, you know, uh, again, it's one of those things where like, yeah, an apostle means a sent out one. But it also means kind of a specific thing. Like, I, I'm not going to go to the grocery store if Rachel sends me there to get bread and tell the grocer that I'm uh I'm an apostle they're there to pick up bread just because I've been sent. There's um, and uh, and we have kind of softened the the idea of the word apostle in some instances. Uh, but really what it meant was somebody who was directly sent by Christ, um, somebody who Christ uh, appeared to or um, after his resurrection and gave instructions to. That's what an apostle meant. Um, I remember, well, like my dad, um, when, when I was growing up, there was the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. And I asked my dad, so what does the Ayatollah mean? And, and the, the definition was a uh, spiritual leader. And I go, well, you're a spiritual leader because he's a pastor, you know? So I called my dad Ayatollah John Deacock, right? Uh, but, it, you know, obviously it's a joke because, you know, you can't just say spiritual leader. That's what Ayatollah means. And then apply it to your pastor or whatever, just because there's a certain meaning um, uh, behind that. So that's kind of like where um, Paul is kind of having to prove himself to be an apostle because they're like, well, you didn't walk with Christ. You weren't there when he appeared to the, the 500. So, uh, and on top of that, they were slamming Paul because apparently he was like the short guy. Um, and he didn't look very good, apparently bow-legged. He had some eye condition um, and um, and people think that some scholars think that it, it that would include like pussiness. And on top of being, you know, having the tar beat out of him a, a, a bunch of times, uh, he probably appeared like a walking mess a lot of the time, you know, like um, bruised up, not very. And and he couldn't really talk that well, apparently. He was better in writing than he was in person. So there was a slam on him where like some people were, it, it could have been that people were calling him this, this name that they were used to uh, as an, uh, um, that they used for an abortion. Right. So he kind of, it's, it's uh, he could be like uh, adopting that term for himself. He goes, yeah, go ahead and call me that because I'm the least of all the apostles. You know, I don't even deserve to be apostle. And if you're going to slam me, great, because I don't care because I'm here to push Christ, not myself. So um, he says, for I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church 
of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, which is an apostle. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, than any of the other apostles. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So whether it was I or they, the other apostles, so we preached and so you believed. So however God's going to reach you, that's how we um, how we reached you. Um, so let's talk about grace for a second, because one of the things that like um, we know that you know, grace has been defined as unmerited favor and and kind of related maybe to the idea of um, mercy. Uh, I've heard people say, well, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Um, and I think that that's a big part of it. Um, Paul deserved a punishment for what he was doing to Christ's body right? Um, but uh, he got favor in the sight of God and um, the honor of becoming uh, an apostle. Christ appeared to him and sent him out. So, um, you know, it is unmerited favor. Uh, God chose Paul despite his sin. But I think an even easier way to understand what grace is, is that, that grace is a work of God. In other words, that's something that God does um, to either, uh, you know, if we talk about that, that gifts are sent, uh, uh, that we receive gifts by grace, it's something that God does that we, we don't do, right? Um, it's like, uh, whether you can, you're considering it favor or not favor, it's just something that Christ does or that God does. So in this, and, and most of the time, what we're talking about is an empowerment or an, or an, uh, a making able uh, making you able in your life to uh, to to either work out your salvation, to become more like more like God, um, to participate in God's um, godliness and His goodness and His love, uh, things that we are not able to do just on our own, um, to live a Christ-like life, um, or to do something specific, um, to do a, a job like Paul was supposed to do. Uh, to prepare yourself and others for his coming, to prepare him, uh, the world and yourself for the, the parousia. So for him, it was, um, so like, if you look at this wording by the grace of God, basically he's saying, I'm an apostle and his grace towards me, um, was not in vain because I, his grace enabled me to work harder and go further than any of the other apostles. Um, but it wasn't me. It was the grace of God that was with me that uh, enabled me to to uh, stand in the face of all those beatings or and uh, all that opposition and that, um, you know, that bludgeoning and the thorn in my side. You know, the God's grace has always been sufficient for me to to be able to 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 handle that. You know, when you when you see Paul say something like um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, he's talking about being in prison. He's talking about, you know, the struggles that he had to face. And you're like, wow, how was Paul able to handle all of that? You know, and it was the grace of God that enabled him to do that. That's what he's saying. So now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? Pagans didn't believe in the resurrection. Um, in fact, they thought if you, it was, uh, the, the Greek philosophers thought that it was a good thing to be separate from this body. Uh, why would you even want to come back to this physical body and to we'll return to this world again? That was, uh, so, you know, that you had Paul going to the Areopagus and he preached and, uh, and they, he had like a listening ear with a lot of them, but when it came to resurrection, that became foolishness to them because they were like, well, you know, they're interested in all these philosophies and religion and things like that. But they were like, well, now you've lost us because you're talking about re what resurrecting back into this body. They couldn't really um, relate to that. And actually it's, it's not dissimilar to a lot of uh, 
the way we think about it, uh, things uh, today. In a lot of ways, we brought over Greek thinking into um, the Western world and even into Western Christianity. So the pagans, um, they kind of didn't, they didn't believe in a, in, in a bodily resurrection. The Sadducees actually didn't either because the Sadducees had been so Hellenized um, on one hand. And on the other hand, uh, yeah, the Sadducees, they, they didn't believe in anything besides the five books of the Bible. So, you know, they, they weren't looking at Job or Daniel and other um, explicitly um, resurrection type passages. But that's why Jesus addresses the Sadducees by, by quoting verses from the Torah, from the first five books. Um, and he says, even in your context, you have to have a, a resurrection because he is the father of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob. And he's not the God of the living. Uh, he's not the God of the dead, but he's the God of the living. Um, that's how he addressed the Sadducees. The Pharisees, they believed in a resurrection. And that includes Paul. Paul was looking forward to a resurrection. And one of the reasons that, you know, you have this, this uh, realization um, is, is because of justice of the people who have died. In other words, if you have a whole bunch of people who were evil, who died in wealth and on top of everything, and you have a bunch of people who were serving God, but they died in poverty and being downtrodden and uh, dealt with unjustly, that can't be the end of it. Um, so they knew that um, no matter what happened, there's got to be a resurrection. I mean, the, the, these are some of the things that they're saying. I mean, um, you know, they, and they can read Job, they can read Daniel, and they, they know that there's going to be a resurrection. So, but, you know, these Corinthians, even if they had accepted that Jesus rose from the dead physically, a lot of the Corinthians believers, believers may not have put the two together that therefore they would also be raised. And I think that that's the way that it is with um, a lot of Christians. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's fair to say, but that's the impression that I've got um, where, you know, we'll, we'll uh, you got a lot of people looking at Jesus and his resurrection and then think, well, if he raised, if Jesus rose from the dead, then when I die, I'm going to die and go to heaven, uh, but never really think about the physical resurrection uh, from then on. So it's it's kind of like there's a, not everybody's going to put everything together, you know, but Paul is, and Paul's going to say then, well, what are you preparing for? In other words, he's going to bring up a whole bunch of things. We're living really tough sometimes miserable lives, you know, and Paul's, you know, like a prime example of that. They're risking their lives for um, to spread a message that Jesus rose from the dead. What sense that would that make if, um, if it wasn't true? Why would we, we risk everything and go through all this trouble and make our present lives miserable if resurrection for us is not um, in the future? says, but if there is no resurrection from the dead, then they, not even Christ has been raised. So the reality of our resurrection is so strong in Paul's mind that he puts it this way around. He's not saying, you know, that um, uh, he's saying if there's no resurrection of the dead in general for humanity, then not even Christ has been raised from the dead. Then that's a lie. So he's actually making uh, the resurrection of of humans, uh, the main thing, and that um, Jesus, uh, uh, you know, that that that's that's um, that's the main thing. If there's no resurrection for all of us, then Christ hasn't been raised either. Is what he's saying. So if it's not promised to humanity, it didn't happen to Christ. So as a Pharisee, as I'd said, Paul believed in the resurrection long before he accepted Christ. When he saw Christ, he knew that. He had what he had long believed in and put his hopes in had started to happen. So I don't think that you can say fairly that um, what happened on the Damascus Road was the conversion of Paul. We 
um, we we talk about um, Paul as you know that that was Paul's conversion. It's not exactly what we would call a conversion. All the parts of that had um, were already there in Paul's mind, um, but uh, what was revelatory to him was that Christ was the one that he had been hoping for. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. In other words, we're making this all up and we're lying because we testified about, testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. If the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. He's not tying the sin, the, the forgiveness of sins and the to Christ's death as much as he uh, ties it to Christ's resurrection. Um, then those who have also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So Jesus died for our sins, but that's not the complete work of Christ that saves us from our sins. You do not have freedom of sin without the resurrection. Um, freedom from sin is only as real as the resurrection. If there, you know, it's important that Jesus is the sacrifice, but um, you don't have resurrection and you're still in your sin if Jesus didn't get raised physically. The resurrection of Christ marks the victory over sin and death. The sin of the first Adam result, resulted in death, and the resurrection of the last Adam is the defeat of death and the erasure of sins. That's kind of a mouthful, but um, uh, in other words, when Christ was resurrected, it, it signaled that there was victory over sin and death. Somebody had victory over sin and death and came back to life. Um, because sin and death ruled in this world. Um, and once you died, there was no way out of it. Um, but now he's going to, uh, because of the, um, he's the, the, the first fruits and the, I would say kind of like the, the signpost of the, the general resurrection for humanity, um, that that's what it signified to people. The sin of the first Adam resulted in death um, because, well, it would have resulted from any subsequent human, I suppose, as well. But the the um, but sin started ruling in the world because of Adam and was led into the world because of Adam. But the resurrection of the last Adam, who's Christ, is the defeat of death and the erasure of sin. It gets that's what gets rid of sin. It's like if you look at the, if you look at like both, both things, um, you know, like as bookends, you know, Christ and Adam, and you have death in the middle. It's kind of like, a, you know, what Christ did is working the same pattern only in reverse of what um, happened with Adam. <clears throat> if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So, because they, the ones who are um, Paul and the other apostles and believers, they're having some of the worst lives. And if Christ is, is their hope in only this life, well, then um, it's, it's really bad for them because they're being shut out of their communities. They're being, they're losing their jobs. They're being whipped. They're being stoned. They're going to be killed, a lot of them. You know, so, um, you know, it can't be about this world. Um, notice that Paul doesn't address the thought that Christ is raised from the dead so that we could be spiritually alive with him in heaven forever when we die. For him, the entire argument hinges on Jesus and our bodily resurrection. So if in Christ we have hope in this life, only we are um, of all people the most to be pitied and he's not talking about us being uh going to heaven and being and escaping and being with him he keeps on talking about the this is all in the context of bodily resurrection 
In fact, he will point out that all of our toil for him is in vain if there is no resurrection. We're not, we're not toiling. We're not preparing for eternity in heaven. We're toiling and preparing to get ready for Jesus coming back, his parousia, and when he will judge the world. <clears throat> but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So first fruits are basically, you know, like uh, you're going to have a harvest and there's some things that are going to um, bloom and then eventually produce fruit before the rest of the harvest. It's not just a promise. It's not just earlier in time of a car coming harvest. And it's not just the, you know, the promise that the harvest is coming. It's also an indicator of the quality of the coming harvest. In other words, if you had a first fruits and it wasn't that good, um, that may be a bad indicator for what kind of a harvest you were going to have. Or if you were going to have like a really rich and uh, uh, fruitful first fruits, then uh, that pointed to a very, very good season. You know, so um, the, the qual it's not just about, um, you know, being first in time, but also whatever uh, Jesus body was in its glorified state. And it's also an indicator of what we have to look forward to, to be glorified with Christ in the resurrection uh, with the kind of body that he has um, from his resurrection. It says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the father, after destroying every rule and every authority and, and power. He's talking about the, um, he is talking about the demonic powers. He's talking about the, the gods of the worlds, uh, the gods of the nations, um, I think he's also maybe including the 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 uh, authorities that are under their control. In other words, you know, the the kings and leaders and tyrants and uh, politicians and and that's those sorts of things. But he's mostly talking about the behind the scenes authorities and powers for he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. So he's quoting Psalm 110. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So this is working its way backwards. The last one to be destroyed is death itself or himself. So from one Psalm 110, it says, the Lord said to my Lord, this is David, um, you know, writing the song. The Lord says, to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion, your mighty scepter rule in the midst of your enemies. That's what he's saying. Um, quoting here um now he is going to connect i maybe should have put this verse in a different place he's going to connect um a number of verses um to not just what is going on with um with christ ruling but with us ruling too so in another passage in romans um paul says the god of peace will soon crush satan under your feet so this is all about putting the, the enemy under Christ's feet. We, uh, we know this already from the, um, from the prophecy that's given to Eve at the fall that, you know, the, the, the serpent would strike at, his, at her seed's heel, but, the, um, but that he would crush um, the serpent's head. And we know that if it, it focuses on the Messiah ultimately, right? That it's Christ who is going to crush Satan under his feet. But what Paul is, is doing is that he's making this go, um, how should I say? That what Christ is doing is he's doing it on behalf of humanity. What Christ does is also what Christ's people will do and what they do. In other words, Christ ruling means humanity being restored to rulership and Christ's people ruling. Okay, that's one example. Here, um, uh, 
Paul would say, you know, Jesus is going to crush Satan under his feet. Um, and um, but he also says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And he's telling that to the Romans. So he does something like that here. It says um, in verse 27 and 28, it says, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. So he's talking about Christ here, right? But he's quoting Psalm 8, where it's just talking about humanity and that how man, God has put um, uh, everything in, subject in subjection under man's feet. We'll get there in a second. It says, but when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjected subjection under him. In other words, that, you know, the, the son himself is going to be subject, uh, subject under God and is always subject under the father, I should say. When all things are subjected to him, that is to Christ, then the son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in, su in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Because what humanity's job has always been was is to bring creation in subjection to God. So as kings and priests, that we rule with God's authority, and then as uh, and also bring um, creation before God. So the so it's from the outset, from the beginning, Adam was created for this purpose. And the second Adam, who is Christ, is fulfilling the things that Adam was tasked to do with, to do. Uh, so um, let's go to Psalm 8 here. Um, this is just 3 through 6. It says, when I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man? that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the Elohim or the angels and, and depending on your translation and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over your, the works of your hand and you have put all things in subjection under his feet. That's what Paul is quoting right now. Um, referring to Christ. Um, if you were here for our Hebrews Bible study, maybe you remember this in Hebrews. And I'm, I'm kind of taking a couple of our versions that we have. Um, if you look in the NIV and the ESV and you kind of put them together, um, this is kind of what you get. Um, because when you when you uh, Psalm eight here, you have man as you know, man can be singular or it can be. It's mankind, which is a plural, right? Um, and, uh, and so it's um, it can be a, a little bit ambiguous, but it just depends on like how you how it's being used. So here's where it's um, here's how it makes sense, okay? And um, this is kind of like the clearest way that I I could find to present this. It was not to angels because it's talking about um, Christ being higher than the angels or um, because in the writer of Hebrews, it's like, no, you know, God did not have an angel sit with him and say, I'm going to put the nations under your feet. He didn't say that to an angel. He said that to, he said that to Christ, right? He said that to a man. It says, for it was not to angels or the Elohim that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? So this is just kind of re reword um, Psalm eight a little bit. What is mankind that you are mindful of them or the son of man that you care for him? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under their feet. Even if you were just to put, say the single man, you know, what is man that you're mindful of him? or the son of man that you care for him, you made him a little while lower than the angels, you still have that, that idea of humanity, right? And in, um, in Psalm 8. Now here it says, now putting every, 
in putting everything in subjection to them, into ma to man or mankind, he left nothing outside their control or man's control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to mankind, to them. But we see him, who's Christ, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the sufferings of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So, um, it, so the writer of Hebrews is seeing that um, what's been promised to humanity in Psalm 8 is also talking about uh, Christ in specific. But it goes it goes both ways. What Christ did specifically has ramifications for mankind. Paul, like the writer of Hebrews, is using Psalm 8, which is about humans in general, about Christ specifically. And it goes both ways. The resurrection and authority of Christ is true about redeemed humanity. Job's redeemer lives. Job knew that his redeemer lived and that therefore Job was also going to see him when Job was resurrected, as Job believed in his resurrection. So Job knows he will be resurrected too. Jesus defeated the serpent and the serpent will soon be crushed under our feet. So it's uh, what Jesus does with the serpent. Paul saying it's going to be done through his body either two or, you know, uh, um, but that's um, all authority has been given to Jesus. So we've been given the grace, or the task, the same way that uh, grace was given to Paul to preach the word and to, to reach others and prepare people for the coming of the Lord. Um, we've been given the, the task and the grace to free the world from the grip of principalities and powers. So, when Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, he follows it with a go, therefore, because the implication is, I've done this, now go do it, um, and uh, bring healing to the world, um, you know, cast out demons, um, take authority, um, change the world, you know, do this on God's behalf. The earth has been put in subjection under our feet in order to restore it to God. It's, it's in the process, I should say, of being restored under um, the follower of Christ's feet in order to restore to God. Our task is to, re, um, it, in um, 2 Corinthians, it says that to us has been given the ministry of reconciliation. So the Christ, of course, his ministry was that of reconciliation between God and us and the rest of the world, but um, we continue that minute. That, that task has been um, handed down to us, the Ministry of Reconciliation. So we'll um, continue with this, um, uh, this chapter uh, next week, and we'll see how far we get. So any comments, insinuations? <laughs> Sports scores. Evan, you got anything? <laughs> I miss Steve and the Aaron's. Yeah. I'm going to 